I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, but in there somewhere and all that is a, a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Oh, hello, and welcome to the Leaves of Glen Mansion. It's a fun little bit where I pretend to live in a mansion and not just recording in my basement. This is where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories. And this week, we're continuing to read A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, a story that I am rifling through at uh, lightning speed to try and get all the episodes out before Christmas because I didn't think ahead to look at how many chapters or pages there were. I thought, oh, it's a short story, right? It can't be that big. It's a short goddamn story, and I forgot it's Charles Dickens, and everything he writes has to be nine miles long. Uh, about the author, Charles Dickens was born the 7th of February, 1812, and died the 9th of June, 1870. He was an English writer, social critic, and human jerk to his wife and kids. He created some of the world's best-known fictional characters and is regarded by many as the greatest novelist of the Victorian era and a fantastic asshole to the people around him, as you might have known if you listened to the intros on the last two episodes. His works are enjoyed uh, in popularity during his lifetime, and by the early 20th century, critics and scholars have recognized him as a literary genius. His novels and short stories are widely read today. Interesting to note, uh, he was obsessed with an old high school romance and had a secret love letter writing affair behind his wife's back until he saw this woman in person and decided she was too fat. Uh, so I mentioned that in the beginning of the uh, last episode. So let's learn more horrible things about this guy who everyone loves because all his characters have wacky names. Uh, the troubled story of Charles Dickens? No, oh, I'm sure we're going to hear about how he suffered. Charles Dickens was one of the greatest writers in England. Okay, yeah. Living and working during England's Victorian era, Dickens' work is marked by its length, yes, verbosity, uh-huh, as well as its exploration of our common universal living experience. Dickens explored poverty and debt in the shocking state of education in the orphanage system in England at the time, and unrequited love, of course, and he said against the lushly detailed portrait of the world often spanning entire lifetimes of his characters, novels like Great Expectations, David Copperfield and Tale of Two Cities have become iconic works of literature. Many people don't know about the troubled story of Charles Dickens behind his writing. Uh, debt stole Charles Dickens' childhood. Anyone even casually familiar with Dickens' work knows that certain themes crop up over and over again. Although modern adaptations often play up the whims whimsical eh, Victorian setting of his stories, uh, themes concerning debt, uh, poverty, and rough, unhappy childhoods are everywhere. The source of these themes, sadly, was Dickens' own childhood. As Forbes notes, Dickens' father, John Dickens, was a man who struggled his whole life to make a living and provide for his family. As this was long before there were child labor laws, when Dickens was 12, he and his older sister, Fanny, were forced to leave school, and he had to take a job at Warren's blacking factory. Uh, the little boy sat in a room with dozens of other children, pasting labels on bottles of shoe polish. Uh, he, he later said that no words can express the secret agony of my soul and describe the grief and humiliation he felt. There is little doubt that this awful period of Dickens' childhood influenced his writing as debt uh, and away. Childhood can be turned into a bleak uh, experience. Uh, Charles Dickens lost his little brother and sister. Jesus, he did have kind of a hard life. Maybe they, there's a reason why he's such a dick to people. Dickens' family was a large one. Uh, Charles was the second oldest and had six siblings. Sadly, two of these siblings died very young. An author, Keith Hopper, writes, Alfred uh, Dickens was born in March 1814. Since the Dickens family was enjoying a rare moment of financial stability, John Dickens chose to announce the birth in a London newspaper. Charles was just at two years old, but he had uh, never got the chance to get to know his brother, Alfred died just six months after he was born. According to the author Michael Slater, the official cause of death was listed at the time as water on the brain. The hell? 
which likely indicates a form of uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, I said that correctly. Dickens' sister Harriet was uh, born when Charles was seven years old, and he had a much stronger relationship with her. As Keith Hopper notes, uh, not much is known about Harriet or how she died. It is theorized that she died of smallpox. Uh, his father went into debtor's prison. I remember reading about that. And uh, his family was evicted, and he, he lost his first love. Well, that wasted a lot of time. Why don't we dive into the next chapter? Well, there you go. Get yourself all settled here in the master library of my mansion. Eh, isn't that fun? The second of three spirits. Stave three. Awakening in the middle of a prodigiously long, uh, tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was once again upon the stroke of one. Hmm. And he felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time for a special purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains the new specter would draw back. Yeah, they're all a bunch of perverts peeking in through little curtains. He put them every one aside with his own hands and lying down again established a sharp lookout all around the bed for he wished to challenge the spirit on his moment of its appearance. It did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. Gentlemen of the free and easy sort, who plume themselves upon being acquainted and with a move or two and being usually equal to the time of day, express the wide range of their capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter between which the opposite extremes, no doubt, there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects. Without venturing for Scrooge quite as hardly as this, I don't mind calling on you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances, and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros <laughs> would have astonished him very much. That was pretty clever. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. And consequently, when the bell struck one, and no shape appeared. Now oh, he was taken for a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, man, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All this time he lay in his bed in the very core of the center of a, of a blaze of ruddy light which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, and which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, and he was powerless to make out what it meant or uh, what it would be at. And he was sometimes apprehensive that he might be at this very moment an interesting cause of spontaneous combustion. He <laughs> that's kind of cute. Without having the consultation of knowing it, at last, however, he began to think, as you or I yeah, would have thought at first. For it is always the person not in the predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it. This is why he's so wordy. And would uh, unquestionably have done it too, see? At last, I say, he began to think that the source and the secret of this ghostly light might be in his adjoining room. From whence, on further tracing it, it seemed to shine. Oh, this idea, taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly, eh? shuffled in his slippers to the door. Well, the moment Scrooge's hands was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter. And he obeyed. And it was his own room. Oh, there was no doubt about that, but he had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green, and it looked a, a perfect grove, and from every part of which the bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly and mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there. And such a, a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of the hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's for... Many and many a winter season had gone. Heaped up on the floor to form a, 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 kind, of, a kind of throne were, were turkeys and geese, game, poultry. Wait, turkeys, geese, what's game? Is game a type of animal? Poultry, again, just a broad sweep of birds. Brawn, don't know what brawn is. Let's look up brawn. I have to kindle. I get to do this kind of crap now. Uh, physical strength contrast? Nope. Uh, meat from a pig or calf's head that is cooked. Oh, he's just talking about food. I thought he was living animals. 
Uh, great joints of meat. Oh, sucking pigs. And long wreaths of sausages. Uh, mince pies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The plum puddings. Uh, barrels, of oy- barrels of oysters. Gross. Red hot chestnuts. Cherry cheeked apples. Juicy oranges. Luscious. Oh, God, luscious pears. And juicy oranges. Uh, I just said that part. Immense twelfth cakes. I don't know what a twelfth cake is. I'm not looking it up. And seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. Sounds gross. It sounds really humid in there. In easy state, I mean, all that meat just sitting there, steaming up the place with a bunch of fruit doing the same thing. In easy state upon his couch, just sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in the shape not unlike Plenty's horn. And he held it up. Uh, held it up high to shed the light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Uh, come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come on in and, and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit, and he was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and though the, through the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. Now, I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Oh, look upon me. <laughs> I love the concept of, like, I just walk in. Hi, my name's Glenn. Look upon me. Study me from head to toe. Scrooge reverently did so. He was clothed in one simple deep green robe or mantle. Oh, God, he's going to describe everything the guy's wearing. Bordered with white fur, this garment hung so loosely on the figure, and his capricious beast was bare, as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of garment, were also bare, gross, and on its head there were no other covering than a holy wreath, set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as a genial face, its sparkling eye and its open hand. Its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an antique scabbard. No sword was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with uh, rust. Ah, you have never seen the like of me before, eh? exclaimed the spirit. Never, Scrooge made an answer to it. Never walked uh, forth with the younger members of my family, meeting, for I am very young. My elder brothers, born in these latter years, presumed the phantom. I don't think I have, said Scrooge, and I'm afraid I have not. Have you uh, had many brothers, spirit? Oh, oh, I don't know, more than 1,800, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively, conduct me where you will, and I will forth last night on my compulsion, and I will alert a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe! (laughs) Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brown meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruit, punch, and all the vanished instantly. In the of the room, uh, the fire and the ruddy glow, uh, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning, where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings and from the tops of their houses whence it was mad delight the boys to see it come plunging down the road below and splitting into artificial little snow stars. The house fronts looked black enough and the windows blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs and with the dirtier snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been plowed up uh, in deep furrows by heavy wheels of carts and wagons furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels hard to trace uh, the thick yellow mud and icy water Jesus Christ I don't care the sky was gloomy and the shortest streets were choked up with a dingy mist half thawed half frozen whose heavier particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had by one consent caught fire and were blazing away their dear heart's content. There was nothing but cheerful in the climate of the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad that the cleanest summer air eh, and brightest summer sun might have endeavored to diffuse in vain. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops, they were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from their parapets, 
and now and then exchanging facetious snowball <laughs> better natured missile than many of the worldly just laughing heartily as it went right and not less heartily if it went wrong. The poultry shafts were still half open and the fruit ears were radiant in their glory. There were great round pot belly baskets of chestnuts shaped like waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the doors and tumbling out of the street in their apocalyptic opulence. Now there were ruddy bur- bur- brown faced uh, broad girth Spanish onions shining in the in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars and winking from their shelves in wanton slyness at the girls as they went by <laughs> and glanced immediately at the hung up mistletoe. Oh, there were pears uh, and, uh, and, uh, 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 and apples clustered high in the blooming pyramids. Now there were bunches of grapes made the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from capricious hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. Oh, there were piles of filberts. I don't know what a filbert is, but I'm not looking it up. I can't keep stopping the show to look things up. Mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings ankle deep through withered leaves where the Norfolk biffins, don't know what that is, not looking it up, squab, what, swarthy, settling off in the yellow of the oranges and lemons and in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags. Had eaten after dinner. God, that was long. There was no commas or nothing. The very gold and silver fish set forward among these choice fruits in a bowl, uh, though members of a dull and stagnant-blooded race appeared to know that there was nothing going on, and uh, to a fish went gasping round and round their little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers? Exclamation point. Oh, the grocers! Nearly closed, but with perhaps two shutters down or, or, or one. But those gaps, oh, such glimpses, exclamation point. It was not alone that the scales descended upon the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and the roller parted company so briskly, or that the canisters were rattled up and down like, like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, eh, eh? or even that the raisins, so plentiful and rare, and the, and the, and the, and the almonds, so extremely white, and, and sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other sli- uh, spices so delicious, the candied fruits, my God, he's got to stop, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the, as to make the coldest lookers on feel faint, and subsequently bilious. Probably not saying that right. Don't get bilious, bilious. I don't know, whatever. Nor was it that the, the figs were moist and pulpy. <laughs> or that the, the French plums blushed in the modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes. Or that, my God, he has got to stop. Or that everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress. But the customers were also hurried and so eager in the hopeful promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door crashing their wicker baskets wildly and left their purchases upon the counter and came running back to fetch them and committed hundreds of their uh, of the like mistakes in the best humor possible while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that their polished hearts, uh, which they fastened their aprons behind, might have, have been their own, worn outside for general inspection and for Christmas dawns to peck at if they chose. Jesus Christ, that was the end of that paragraph. That was insane. It's like the more he's writing, the more he drags it out. <clears throat> it's insane. I wonder what's going on in his head where it's like, I'm not listing off enough stuff. I got to list off more things. No one's going to keep reading this. They're going to get bored. But soon the steeples called good people to all church and chapel. And away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes with the gayest faces. And at the same time, there emerged uh, from scores of by streets, lanes, and nameless turnings, innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in a baker's door. Oh, we're back to them again. Jesus Christ, that took forever. And taking off the covers as their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on their dinners from his torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice, when there were when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, oh, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humor uh, was restored directly. And uh, for they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day. And so it was. God love it. So it was. In the time the bells ceased, and the bakers were shut up, 
and there was a genial uh, shadowing forth of all these dinners and the progress of their cooking and the thawed blotch of the wet above the baker's oven where the pavement smoked as if the stones were cooking too. Uh, is, there, is there a peculiar, a peculiar flavor in what you sprinkle from your torch? Asked Scrooge. There is my own. Uh, would, it, would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? Asked Scrooge. To any kindly given to a poor one most. Uh, why to a poor one most? Asked Scrooge. Because it needs it most. Spirit, said Scrooge, after a moment's thought, I wonder you, of all the beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I, cried the spirit. You would deprive them of their means of dining on each seventh day, often the only day at which they can uh, be said to dine at all, said Scrooge. Wouldn't you? I, cried the spirit. Uh, you seek to close these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge, and it comes to the same thing? I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us, and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, he's doing it again, and selfishness in our name, who are as strange to us and all our kin, uh, kith and kin, as if they have never lived. Remember that, and uh, charge your doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge promised that he would. And they went on, invisible as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. Oh, it's remarkable, uh, the quality of the ghost which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, that they could accommodate himself in any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully as a supernatural creature it was possible that he could have done in any lofty hall. Jesus Christ, I get it. I get the point. You didn't need that many words. I get the point. I get that... People enjoy reading this, and I think if you're just sitting there with your mouth closed reading, it's probably fine. But when you got to read it out loud, this is hell on earth. It's not written badly. I'm not complaining. He was horrible to his wife and his kids and uh, to the woman that he kept flirting with for years over uh, email. But uh, uh, he could write well. It's, it's too much words for a man reading out loud. And perhaps it was the pleasure of the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy for all poor men that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. <gasps> for there he went and took Scrooge with him, holding his robe. There's no periods. It's just commas and semicolons. And on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with that of the sparklings of his torch, period. Think of that! Bob had but 15. Bob, a week himself. <laughs> oh, I get it. Bob, in quotes, a week himself. That's like a money. I think that's like a British money. That's cute. He pocketed on Saturdays but 15 copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house! Exclamation point. Then up rose Miss Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown. But brave in ribbons, which are cheap, and made a goodly show for sixpence. And then he laid his cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, uh, second of the daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar. Uh, Bob's private property conferred upon his son and heir in the honor of the day, there's no periods, into his mouth and rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks, period. I'm dying. And now two smaller Cratchits. Damn it. He's going to describe all of these guys. Boy and girl came tearing in, screaming at the outside of the bakers that they had smelt the goose and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion. And those young Cratchits, oh, they danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit uh, to, the, to, the, to the skies, while, they, while he, not proud, although his collars neatly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. Uh, what has ever... Got your precious father then, said Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother, mm, Tiny Tim, and Martha, uh, weren't you as late last Christmas Day by half an hour? Well, here's Martha, mother, said a girl approaching as she spoke. Uh, here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah! Uh, there's such a goose, Martha. Well, bless your heart alive, my dear. Uh, how late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet uh, with her officious zeal. 
We'd a deal of work to finish up last night, uh, replied the girl, who had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and, and have a warm, comma, Lord bless ye. No, comma, no, exclamation point. There's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere all at once. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, uh, the father, with at least three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable. And, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulders. Oh, great. Alas, for Tiny Tim, uh, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame, exclamation <clears> point. <throat> That's supposed to shock you. For people that have never read this before or seen a thing on TV about it or watched anything from Disney about it. Why, there? Well, where's a Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Eh, not, not coming, said Bob, with a sudden dec- declination in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church <laughs> and had come home rampant, not coming upon Christmas Day. Martha didn't like to see him disappointed as if it were only a joke, so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms. Oh, and while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim, though they bore him off into the wash house where he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. Pudding can sing if you put in a copper. And how, and how did little Tim behave? Asked Mrs. Cratchit when she had rallied Bob on his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob. And better, somehow. He gets thoughtful, said by himself so much. And he thinks the strangest things he ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church because, uh, because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who had made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Well, Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that uh, Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch uh, was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken. Escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire, and while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded by some hot mixture uh, in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round, and put it on the, uh, put it on the hob uh, to simmer, Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, uh, with which they had soon returned in high possession. Procession. Whatever, I can say whatever the hell I want, it's my show. With such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds. A, a feathered f- phenomenon. I said that. I did pull it off. To which a black swan was a matter of course, and in truth it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, uh, ready beforehand, a little, uh, a little, a little saucepan, yeah, 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 yeah. hiss and hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with the incredible vigor, eh? and Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce, and Martha dusted the hot plates, and Bob took uh, Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. Oh, Tiny Tim in a tiny corner. Uh, with a young Cratchit set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves and mounting guard upon the post, crammed spoons in their mouths lest they should shriek for goose before, the, before their turn came to be helped, and at last the dishes were set on, and the grace was said, and it was succeeded by a breathless pause as Miss Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge into the breast. But it was, uh, but what she did, and when the long expected gush of stuffing is- f- issued forth, one murmur of delight rose all around the board. And even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and, and-, and feebly cried, uh, <clears throat> uh, Hurrah! There was never such a goose. I know he said that like nine times now. Bob said he didn't believe that there was ever such a goose. He's still saying it. Uh, it was cooked. It's tenderness. Its flavor, its size and shepherdness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was sufficient dinner for the whole family. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, as Miss Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all last. Oh, yeah, everyone had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped 
It's sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now the plate's being changed by Miss Belinda. Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it would not be uh, done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody... Jesus criminy. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall in the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose and the supposition in which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed... Hello! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell of like a washing day. It was the cloth. It was the smell of an eating house and a pastry cook's next door. He's going to talk about the smells. He's going to sit here and list off all different ways things can smell. Uh, pastry cooks next door to each other with a laundriness next door to that exclamation point. That's the that was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half and half a quarter turn of ignited brandy and bed light with the Christmas holly stuck at the top. Oh, oh, a wonderful pudding! Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, uh, that he regarded as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Oh, and Mrs. Cratchit said now that uh, that the weight was off her mind that she could confess that she had her doubts about the quantity of flour, and everybody had something to say about it, but nobody had said it. They were all with the small pudding in a large family. It would have been a flat hair say to say so. Hattie Cratchit would have blushed if they had such thing. At last, the dinner was all done. The cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect. Apples and oranges were put upon the table and the shovel full of chestnuts on the fire and then with all the Cratchit family drew around the hearth and what Bob Cratchit called the circle meeting that was done with this one and that Bob Cratchit's elbow stood at a family display of glass in the tumblers and a cupboard or without a handle. These held the hot stuff nah, from the jug. However, it was well as the golden goblets would not have done and Bob served out there with the beating looks and while the chestnuts and the fire spluttered and the correctly noiselessly Bob possessed. A Merry Christmas to all! Eh... And my dears, God bless us, to which the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon the little stool, and Bob held his withered little hand, his withered little hand, oh boy, <laughs> as if he had loved this child, and he wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest that he had never felt before. Uh, tell me if uh, if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved if these shadows remain unaltered by the future. The child will die. Oh, uh, no, no, said Scrooge. No, no, kind spirits say that he'll be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other than my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. Uh, what then? Uh, if he be like to die, he had better do it and uh, decrease the surplus population. Well, Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by that spirit and was overcome with penance and grief. Oh, my God. This is a tough one. Uh, speaking of tough, Tiny Tim isn't so tough. He's got a tiny little withered hand. He's this tiny little thing that rides uh, blood horses all the time. And, uh, and then he just uh, sits, they put him in a corner next to the fireplace at a tiny little table for Tiny Tim in his little crutch. And uh, they just uh, stick him over there. And so this uh, kid is just kind of uh, both stuffed away off to the side and also uh, so, uh, kind of like a, a family mascot. Uh, oh, God, we all hope he doesn't die. Uh, we just think he's just so great. Also, sit over there. Uh there was a man who once also experienced something very similar, and he lived, uh, and he rose to great prominence. He was a man that had a problem with his legs, and because of his legs having a problem, most women didn't like him. Uh, he kind of he was too poor to get a wheelchair, so he just kind of crawled around on the floor, going from one class to another in school. But uh, but you know, he. He improved his own lot, and also, mind you, he lived. And that person would be Stephen Dorglas from Dorglass Incorporated, D-O-R-G-L-A-S-S dot com. Oh, he's a, they're dedicated to fabricating and professionally installing the highest quality glass products for the nation's top manufacturers. Their inventory, combined with their years of experience, makes them the premier source for installation and repair. They approach every project with the same goals, professionalism, 
integrity, and in the case of constructing an entire glass suit that can help support your body so that you can learn to retrain to walk yourself and build up the muscles that you need without anyone actually seeing that you're wearing anything because it's glass, and glass is invisible. All they can see is like your leg hairs are kind of pressed up against you, but otherwise, uh, that guy's walking. He wasn't walking. He's crawling across the floor. I saw him crawl to uh, math class yesterday, but now he's up there walking around like a normal guy like the rest of us, and everyone's like, oh, Stephen Douglas, uh, why don't you come to my uh, grill? What do, what do teens do? Do teens uh, have grilling parties? I imagine they probably do. Stephen Douglas, can you come to my grilling party? We're going to make gonna make ham. Stephen Douglas, he just kind of waddles on over, and no one can see the glass tippy-tapping, tippy-tapping and, and against the ground along his shoes. And they, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be there. I'll, be there. I'll, even, bring, I'll even bring the hot dogs. And everyone goes, oh, Stephen Douglas has considered a new meat that we've never grilled before. And so then Stephen Douglas became the most popular man. And, uh, and then because he was happy, he just wanted to be more healthy. And then he, and then he lived. So when it comes to trying to make a glass suit for anyone else that wants to keep a little secret, tap my nose, uh, he's discreet. What do they do? Commercial storefronts, automatic entrances, windows, patio doors, mirrors, shower doors, installation repair, and they design and build anything you want, including glass suits. Uh, Clients, Pottery Barn, Williams, Sonoma, Sherman, Williams, Portillo's, which is a sandwich shop that nobody cares about in Minneapolis, Uh, the Salt Cave, which is a place in Minneapolis where they have Himalayan salt lamps, uh, a room that's just the walls are made of Himalayan salt and they're backlit, so it looks like you're sitting inside someone's uh, glowing lungs and you're supposed to do white people shit like yoga and uh, hot yoga and just anything that involves stretching while you sweat and you do that and then uh, but you know don't touch the walls it says on the website for the love of god do not touch the walls but if I got in there you know wink wink I definitely lick the walls just to see what they taste like and Applebee's well with that why don't we retire upstairs to my master bedroom where uh, we can spread out a across the silken sheets of my heart-shaped waterbed, which is something that's, I think and you can engineer that. It's physically possible to have a heart-shaped waterbed and it wouldn't pop all the time. Uh, where I can tell you about the latest in romance literature from Penguin Random House Books. Ah, there you are. You've shown up, uh, damn it. Why are you in my romantic bedroom? So look at the scarf that I'm making. You're going to make me measure the scarf right now? I'm yes, in the middle of podcasting. Oh, for because Christ's sake. Yarn and I make sure it's one my daughter's knitting me a scarf. Is it knitting? Yeah. It's Is it not crocheting? No, it's knit. Oh, it just, oh, I it all fell out. Oh, this thing's gotten real long. Oh, I feel like my own little Bob Cratchit. This is fantastic. Is it long enough? Because there's really not a whole lot left. Finish it off, man. Use the rest. Well, I'm going to, but then it's a if done it deal. Long enough, I'd have to buy. I it. think it's long enough. It's good. This is going to be fine. Okay. It's the it's like gift of the magi. You're going to make me a scarf, and I. How does that work? I sacrifice something. I don't know what you're talking about. Gift of the magi, where the guy sells his watch to buy his wife a hair clip, but the wife shaves all her hair off to buy him a watch chain. You don't care about Christmas at all, do you? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm trying to talk sexy to the people on my podcast. Oh, well, uh, that was unfortunate. Uh, But uh, something about the fact that you're wearing a sexy scientist outfit and you want to study my phallus is not working because my kid was just in the room. So now there's no way I'm feeling erotic whatsoever. But I will still read to you the book you threw on my bed, Loathe to Love You by Allie Hazelwood. Uh, that's, uh, you want to hear about Low to Love You by Allie Hazelwood? The kid's still in the room. Uh, from the New York Times bestselling author of The Love Hypothesis comes a collection of steamy, staminous novels uh, featuring a trio of engineers and their loves in loathing. Yeah, yeah, with a special bonus chapter, one called Under One Roof, an environmental engineer discovers that scientists should never cohabitate. And uh, when she finds herself stuck in the roommate, my kid just dropped the, the knitting needle, with the, the roommate from hell. A a detestable big oil lawyer who won't leave the thermostat alone. And stuck with you, a civil engineer and her nemesis uh, take their rivalry and love to the next level when they get stuck in a New York elevator. And below zero, a NASA aerospace engineer's frozen heart melts as she uh, lies injured and stranded in a remote Arctic research station with only one person willing to undertake the dangerous rescue mission of her longtime rival. 
You can hear my child screaming in the background. There's no way there's anything romantic about this. So that's Load to Love You by Allie Hazelwood. Uh, it's coming out uh, January 3rd from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Bookshop.org, Hudson Booksellers, Indie Bound, Powell's Target, and Walmart. Well, why don't we leave this room? Apparently my kid's sitting here knitting, talking to my wife. So I guess I'm going to go back down and finish reading the rest of this story. Ah, oh, there you are. <clears throat> Look, uh, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, we we're trying to have a little romantic moment, and my my teenage kid come busting in. I'm sure that's got to dampen the mood. Definitely dampen the mood for me. Flaccid the second it happened. But uh, uh, yeah, you know, you know, maybe next time, maybe next time you come over when I read the next chapter, we can get some time alone and uh, and get buck wild. Uh, well, let's continue reading here now. Back in the library, I'm still running with that bit. Uh, verp. Oh, oh, did it again. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked can't until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Why'd he, ca- or he capitalized where? But it's not at the beginning of the sentence. All right, whatever. Well, will you decide what men shall live and what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven that you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like the poor man's child. Oh, God! To hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing that the too much life among the hungry brothers of the dust, Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke and, trembling, cast his eyes upon the ground. But he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Uh, Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. Oh, I'd give a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I'd hope that he'd have a, a good appetite for it. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm going to run with this analogy. Uh, my dear, said Bob, the children, uh, exclamation point, Christmas Day, period. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, said she, on which one drinks that the health of such an odious, stingy, Hard, unfeeling man is Mr. Scrooge. Ah, you know he is, Robert. Nobody knows better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, said Bob's, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit, not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll, uh, he'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. Well, the children drank the toast. They're probably all drinking wine, too. Apparently, everyone drank like crazy back then. Didn't matter if you're five years old. The children drank the toast after her, and it was the first time of their proceedings, which had no heartiness in it. Uh, Tiny Tim drank it all, uh, the last of it, but he didn't care uh, two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow upon the party, which was not dispelled for a full five minutes. After it passed, away they were ten times merrier than before, and from the mere relief of Scrooge, the baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, a full five and sixpence weekly. All the two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice of the milliners, then told him what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she had to work and stretch, and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest. Tomorrow, being a holiday, she passed at home. Also, how she had seen a countess and a lord uh, some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, and in which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time, the chestnuts in the jug went round and round. Oh, and by and by, the kids are just sitting around drinking alcohol. And by and by, it's, what, it's like an apple alcohol with like a carrot in it. I don't know. And they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. 
There was nothing of high mark in this. Uh, they were not a handsome family, and they were not well-dressed. Their, sh their shoes are far from being waterproof. What? Their clothes were scanty, and Peter might not have known, and very likely did, the, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and counted with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's uh, torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last... By this time it was getting dark, and snowing very heavily, and as Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in the kitchens, and the parlors, and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. Here the flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cozy dinner, with hot plates baking through and through before the fire, and deep red curtains ready to be drawn and shut out the cold of the darkness. There, all the children of the house were running out into the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, and aunts, and the first to greet them. Here, again, were shadows on the window blinds of guests assembling, and there was a group of handsome, handsome, handsome girls. Uh, all there, a group of handsome girls, all hooded and fur-booted. Oh, those are the nicest boots. And all chattering at once, tipped lightly off in some near neighbor's house, where, woe upon the single man who saw them enter, uh, artful witches, yeah, uh, they well knew it in a glow. But if you had judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, oh, you might have thought that no one was at home to give them the welcome when they got there. Oh, instead of every house expected coming and piling up fires a half chimney high, blessings on it. Oh, how the ghost exulted, how it bared its breath of breast and opened its capricious palm, floated on outpouring with a generous hand and its bright and harmless uh, mirth on everything within its reach, and the very lamplighter who ran on before, dotting the dusty street with specks of light, and who was dressed to spend the evening somewhere, only laughed out loudly at the spirit path, as though a little Ken and the lamplighter had it ain't company but Christmas. <clears throat> and now, without a word of warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor, where a monstrous masses of rude stone, the worst kind of stone, were cast about as though it were the burial place of giants and water spread itself wherever it listed or it would have done so but for the frost that held a prisoner and nothing grew but moss and furs all right i'm looking up furs it's been a while since i looked anything up furs is a it's a term for gorse okay well that wasn't useful and coarse rank grass down in the west, the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red, which glared upon the desolation for an instant like a sullen eye, and frowning lower, lower, lower yet, God, I hate how he fills this up with words, was lost in the thick gloom of the darkest night. Uh, 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 what, uh, what place is this? asked Scrooge. A place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth returned the spirit. Oh, they know me. See? And a light shone from the window of a hut. And swiftly, they advanced toward it, passing through the wall of uh, mud and stone until they found a cheerful company assembled around a glowing fire. Oh, an old, old man and woman with their children and their children's children, another generation beyond that, all decked out gaily in their holiday attire. The old man in a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind upon the barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. Eh, that's nice. And it was a very old song when he was a boy, but from time to time they all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got uh, quite blithe and loud, and so they, they stopped. Uh, his his vigor sank again. And the spirit did not tarry here. Oh, they bade Scrooge hold his robe and passing on above the moor, sped whither? Question mark. Not to see? Question mark. To see. Period. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land, a frightful range of rocks behind them, uh, and his ears were deafened by the thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged among the dreadful caverns, as it had worn fiercely and tried to undermine the earth. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks, some league or so from shore, on which the waters chafed and dashed, the wild year uh, there with it stood a solitary lighthouse, a great uh, heaps of seaweed, I don't remember any of this from the Disney version, uh, clung to its base and storm birds, born of the wind, one might suppose, as seaweed of the water rose and fell about it, like the waves they skimmed. But even here, 
two men uh, who watched the light made a fire that uh, through the loophole and some thick stone wall uh, shed out a ray of brightness on the awful sea, joining their, ooh, joining their horny hands over the rough table at which they sat. Mm, yes, yes, the tension at that table. And they wished each other a Merry Christmas in their in their can of grog. Oh, and one of them, eh, the elder too, oh, well, oh, nasty, with his face all damaged and scarred. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I can get behind that. With, a, with hard weather, as the figurehead of an old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song that was like, the, uh, like a gale in itself. Well, that ruins the mood. Again, the ghost sped on above the black and heaving sea and on and on until being far away, as he told Scrooge, uh, from any shore, they lighted on a ship. And they stood beside the helmsman at the wheel and looked out upon the bow and the officers who had, had the watch, dark ghostly figures on their several stations, but every man among them hummed a Christmas tune, or had a, a Christmas thought, uh, or spoke below his breath about the companion of some bygone Christmas day, with homeward hopes belonging to it, and every man on board, waking or sleeping, good or bad, had a kinder word for one another than on that day, than any other day that year, and had shared some extent of its festivities, and had, uh, oh, had remembered those he cared for at a distance, and had known that they delighted to remember him. Oh, it was a great surprise to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind, and burp, thinking that a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss, whose, whose, uh, whose depths were secrets as profound as death. Oh, it's a great surprise to Scrooge, while thus engaged to hear a hearty laugh. Oh, it was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it was his own nephews and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing, smiling by his side and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. 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 I'm saying it that way. Also, I'm zoning out while I'm reading this. I get it. They went out to a ship. Everyone's kind. They kept moving on. Now they're like, what, another continent? I don't care. Ha ha, laughed Scrooge's nephew. Ha ha ha. If you should happen by any unlikely chance to know a man more blessed in the laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I could say is, I would like to know him too. All right, whatever. Introduce him to me. Oh my God, drop it. And I'll cultivate his acquaintance. Okay. It is fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is an infection and disease and sorrow, oh, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. And when Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, eh, holding his sides, eh, rolling his head, imagine what that would look like. Somebody holding his sides, bouncing up and down, rolling his head around. That would be terrifying to look at. And twisting his face in the most extravagant contortions. Again, terrifying. Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he. And their assembled friends, uh, being not a bit behindhand, that's one word, roared out lustily. This sounds like a cult. Ha ha, ha 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 ha. Yeah, this sounds like a weird cult thing. He and the Christmas, he said that Christmas was a, a humbug. As I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. And he believed it too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women. They never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. Yeah, she was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with dimpled, surprising look. God, now we're going to describe her for the next five pages. Uh, surprised looking capital face, ripe little mouth that seemed to be uh, made to be kissed. Oh, wow. She had a ripe little mouth that, that seemed made to be kissed. Hmm. As no doubt it was. All kinds of good little dots about her chin. This guy's a pervert. It melted into one another when she laughed. Great. And the sunniest pair of eyes you'd ever saw in any little creature's head. Although, uh, altogether, uh, she was what you would have called provoking. You know, but satisfactory, too. Wow, what a dick. This guy's a dick. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. What a cock. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge. Also, have you seen a picture of this author? He looks like human horseshit. Human horseshit? He just looks like horseshit. The guy's face looks like crap, and he's so judgy about all the women around him. Eh, he's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth. Oh, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. 
Well, I'm sure he's very rich, Fred, hit to Scrooge's knees. At least you uh, always tell me so. Uh, what of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. Uh, he doesn't do any good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. And he hasn't the satisfaction of thinking, ha, 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 that he is ever going to be uh, going to benefit us with it. I have got no patience for him, observed Scrooge's niece, Scrooge's niece's sisters, and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Uh, who suffers by his ill whims? Uh, himself, always. Here he takes it to his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. Uh, what's the consequence? He won't lose much for dinner. Indeed. I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's knees. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been component judges because they had just had dinner, and with the dessert upon the table were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I am glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Hmm. Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, you little piece of shit. You keep your hand off one of Scrooge's niece's sisters. For he answered that the bachelor was a, a wretched outcast who had no right to express any opinion on the subject. Whereat, Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. Oh, he nailed one. He's got one. Go on, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. Oh, he never finishes what he begins to say. He is such a ridiculous fellow. Scrooge's nephew reveled in another laugh which probably sounded very cult-like, and it was impossible to keep the infection off, though the plump sister tried hard to do it with aromatic vinegar. What? His example was unanimously uh, followed. I was only going to say, said Scrooge's nephew, that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm. I'm sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his moldy old office or his dusty chambers. Eh? I mean to, to give him the same chance every year, whether he, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. Oh, Oh, he may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him. If he finds me going there in good temper year after year and, and saying, Hey, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk 50 pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of his shaking Scrooge, but being thoroughly good-natured and not much caring what they laughed at, so they laughed at any rate, and he encouraged them in his merriment, and he passed the bottle joyously. And after tea, they had some music for, oh my God, we're going to start talking about the what they did for the rest of their night. They were a musical family, great, and knowing that they were about when they, they sung, uh, when they sung a glee or catch, don't care, I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl away at the base like a good one, <laughs> and never swell the large veins in his forehead, well, that's weird, or get red in the face over it, Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp, huh, and played, among other tunes, a simple little air. Oh, parentheses, a mere nothing. You might learn to whistle it in two minutes, hmm, and parentheses, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he had been reminded uh, by the ghost of Christmas past. And when the strain of music sounded... All the things that the ghost had shown him that came upon his mind, and he softened more and more, and thought that if he could have listened to it often, years ago, he might have cultivated the kindness of his life for his own happiness with his own hands, without resorting to the sexton's spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't uh, devote the whole evening to the music. Uh, after, oh God, they're going to go through the rest of it. After a while, they played at forfeits. Uh, for it's going to be a children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas. It was a mighty founder, was a child himself. Stop! There was, a, uh, there was first a game at Blind Man's Bluff. Yeah, of course there was. And I no more believe Burp Topper was really blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that it was, it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew and that the ghost of Christmas present knew it, and the way he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature. <laughs> he probably touched her. Knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, and bumping up against the piano, smothering himself against the curtains. Wherever she went, eh, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. 
<laughs> you wouldn't catch anybody else if you had fallen up against them. As some of them did on purpose. Oh, you would have made a, uh, a feint on endeavoring to seize you, which you would have been an affront to your understanding, and would have instantly have sidled off into the direction of the plump sister. Yeah, he often cried out that if it, it wasn't fair, and it really was not. But when, at last, he caught her, when, in spite of all of her silken rustlings and her rapid flusterings past him, he got into a corner whence there was no escape. Oh, there's no escape. And when, he, when his conduct was the most execrable for his pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was, uh, it was necessary to <clears throat> touch her headdress and further to assure himself of her identity by, by pressing a certain ring upon her fender and a certain chain about her neck. And vile, it was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it when, another blind man being in office, they were very com uh, confidential together behind curtains. Yeah, Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind man's blood party, but it was made comfortable with a large chair and a footstool in a snug corner where the ghost and Scrooge were close behind her. But uh, she joined in her Fitz had loved her love to admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. That's a weird way of saying that. Likewise, at the game of how, when, and where, she was uh, very great. We're going to go through all the games they played that night, and to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew, Peter Sisters Hollow. Uh, though they were sharp girls, too, as Topper could have told you, there might have been uh, 20 people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for uh, wholly forgetting in the interest he had in what was going on is that his voice made no sound in their ears. He sometimes came out with his guests quite out loud, and often uh, guessed right, too, for the sharpest needle, best Whitechapel, warranted not to cut in the eye, was not sharper than Scrooge. Blunt as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood. Oh, and he looked upon him with such favor that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guest departed. But this, the spirit said, could not be done. Here is a new game, said Scrooge. <clears throat> one half hour, spirit, only one. There's a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew... Had, oh, my God, don't describe the game. Please don't describe the game. Where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest of them had to find out what it was. Uh, he only answering to their questions, yes or no, and the case was the brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal. Eh? Uh, a live animal. A rather disagreeable animal. Uh, a savage animal. An animal that growled and grunted sometimes. And talked sometimes, eh? And lived in and, and lived in London. And walked. Oh, it's gonna be Scrooge, I bet. And walked about the streets. It wasn't made a show of. It wasn't led by anybody. And he, and he, and he didn't live in a menagerie. And he, he was never killed in a market. He was not a horse, eh? Or an ass, or a, or a cow, or or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, <clears throat> or a uh, or a pig, or a cat. Or a bear, period. My God, that was monotonous. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter. He was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, Oh, I've, I've found it out. I know what it is, Fred. Uh, I know what it is. <laughs> what is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge with a bunch of O's, which it certainly was. Well, I called it. Admiration was the universal sentiment, though some objected that the reply is, a, is it a bear? Ought to have been, yes. It's so much as an answer. The negative was sufficient to divert his thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing that they had ever had any tendency that way. He has uh, given us plenty of merriment, I'm sure, said Fred. And it would be ungrateful not to drink to his health. There is a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand in the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, uh, wherever he is, said Scrooge's nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. And Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have uh, uh, pledged the unconscious uh, company in return. And he, and he thanked them in an audible speech if the ghost had given him time, but the whole scene passed off in his breath, the last words spoken by his nephew, and he, and he and the spirit were upon their travels. 
Much they saw, and far they went. Oh my god, this is not ending. It's got to be done by now. It says I got four minutes left in the chapter. This is insane. Much they saw, and far they went, and the many homes that they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful on foreign lands, and they were close at home by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope by poverty, in which he was rich in alms house, in the hospital, in the gall, in the miseries, in the refuge, and the man that had a little brief authority that had not made it past the door and barred the spirit out with his blessing, and he taught, his, taught Scrooge's precepts. <laughs> it was a long night. If it were only a night. But Scrooge had his doubts of this, because the Christmas holidays appear to be considered into the space of time they passed together, and it was strange, too, that uh, while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older. Clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it until they left the, the children's twelfth night party. Uh, when looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that his hair was gray. I, uh, is his spirit's life so short? Asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Tonight, cried Scrooge. Tonight. At midnight. Hark, uh, the time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing. The three quarters past eleven at the moment. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, said Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe. But I, I, but I, I, I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirts. Is it a, a foot or a, or, a, or a claw? Well, it might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it, said the spirit softly. Uh, look here. And from the foldings of its robe, it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable, and they knelt down at his feet and clung upon the outside of the garment. Oh, man! Look here, look, look, down here, exclaimed the ghost. And there, were, oh, there was a boy and a girl. Yellow, meager, ragged, scowled. Jesus, he's got to go through all... It's like he got a thesaurus. Every time anything is talked about, he pulls out the thesaurus. Yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostate too with their humility. Where graceful youth should have been filled their features out and touched them with the freshest tints, yeah, and stale and shriveled hand, like that of age, had pinched, twisted them, and, and pulled them into shreds, where angels might have sat enthroned devil's lurt and glared out menacing. Oh, no change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any grade uh, through all the mysteries of the wonderful creation has monsters half so horrible and dread. Scrooge, uh, he started back appalled, having them shown to him in this way. Eh? He, having them shown to like, work me into it slowly, give me a warning. And he tried to say that there was a, uh, they were fine children, but the words choked themselves rather than be parties to such a lie of enormous magnitude. A uh, spirit, uh, they, uh, are they yours? Scrooge could say no more. They are man's, said the spirit, looking down upon them. And they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance. The girl is want. Beware of them both, at all their degree. Uh, but most of all, beware of this boy. Uh, for his brow, I can see that written on it, which is doom. Unless the writing be erased, uh, deny it cried the spirit, stretching out his hand toward the city. Slander those who tell it ye. Admit it to yourself, uh, facetious purposes, and make it worse, and bide the end. Uh, have you no refuge or resource? cried Scrooge. Uh, are there no prisons? Uh, said the spirit, turning on him for the last time with his own words. Are there no, uh, uh no workhouses? Well, the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him and the ghost, and he saw it not. At last, the stroke ceased to vibrate, and he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting his eyes, uh, he beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground toward him. Oh, thank God that's done. Let's go downstairs into, uh, into the smoking room and try to review what the hell we just read. Ah, well, there you are. Oh, what a night. What an awkward night. Uh, this chapter went on forever and just never stopped. Uh, there, was a, there was a kid in my sex room. And, uh, and oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, let's just get on to the recap. Uh, what happened? He, he, the ghost is late, but actually the ghost is hanging out in his living room. Uh, and uh, the ghost is really jolly, like a Saint Nick, I guess, kind of Saint Nick ripoff. I'm sure back then Saint Nick was a brand new thing. So he's like, oh, I'm going to write a, I'm going to write my own version of it. I'm going to kind of own the whole Saint Nick thing. So he threw that in there 
Yeah, there was fowl and pig's heads and everything, and everything's just everything in the room is just moist. And, and so with the fruits and the meat, and so then uh, then they go flying around forever to go see the Cratchit House and the Tiny Tim, and then they uh, they go to like a lighthouse for no reason and a boat. I don't care. And then they went to. I don't care. Uh, it's fine. This is, I like the Disney version better, where Mickey Mouse, uh, they really they really get it short and choppy, nice and punchy. They just get right to the point, this random crap they just went through. Um, and so he got to see the family, and hey, boy, he wished he would have gone, and they all kind of make fun of him, but everyone's nice to him. I don't know people like that. If, uh, if I'm hanging out with friends and we're making fun of someone, we just make fun of them, and then we stop talking. We don't raise a glass to him and toast him like, oh, we're having fun, but we wish him the best. No, when we're making fun of someone, it's because we hate them. And then when we're done talking about how much we don't like them, we just stop talking. And we all just kind of stare at each other for a while. And then we move on to a new topic. No one toasts the person that we hate. We don't like losers. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, what well, was good? Um, I guess... It's still well written. My God, it's wordy. I think in this chapter, more than any others, even the previous stories I've read by Dickens, uh, I have never seen it get so damn wordy. It's like I said earlier, he pulls out a thesaurus. He's like, oh, can't wait to start talking about how bad these kids look. Let's look up anything in the thesaurus for uh, words relating to crap kids. And then he just starts listing them off page after page after page. It's ridiculous. Did he not have an editor? There had to be an editor to be like, I like your story. You know how to write, except for the fact that you flesh things out. We're not going to pay you by the word if you're just wasting everyone's time. But uh, apparently they still paid him by the word anyways. What sucks? The length of time that it takes for him to write something. He could have really shortened this chapter up. Uh, Not much of a short story. What do we learn? Uh, It doesn't take much to make a crabby old person who's got some sort of mental illness that makes him want to hoard things and uh, live more or less in poverty while he sits on a mountain of wealth. That's not just a jerk. That's just someone that's got like a a mental problem. That's a person that's got some sort of condition, Uh, something that should probably be treated or you should talk to someone about it. Or maybe he can be given tips on how to work through it to try to like live more comfortably with his money or maybe do something productive with his money so he feels like he's sort of winning that game too or whatever. Uh, No, in here it's just like a... Ah, you're rich, and uh, and you're kind of a jerk, and screw you. So then he just turns it around. All you got to do is just watch people be happy. And he's like, no, I'm happy too. It turns out I've just been lonely the whole time. He's not lonely the whole time. He's just a rich person. Uh, he's a rich person with a with a, an OCD kind of thing going on or something. Uh, and so, But apparently all you got to do is just show him people having a good time, and then, boy, he wishes he could do it too. And also, uh, the, the adorableness of a tiny Tim. Uh, well, with that... Uh, I guess I got, what, two more chapters? The next chapter is The Last Ghost, and then he writes a whole other 50-page chapter after that of just winding down, talking about, like, him reflecting. I can't wait. But uh, with that, thanks for listening, and I'll see you on the next episode. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people. Not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. You can see a backlog of everything I've ever read, including stuff like gestating the curious mind with my lady friend, and also a a little side project I'm going to be doing with my daughter. Oh, I'm on Instagram, but no one uses that anymore because they all use TikTok. Am I ever going to get on TikTok? No. But if you want to look at my dead Instagram, it's at uh, House Nuzzle. I also have Twitter, which I use the most, which is also conveniently at House Nuzzle. Uh, and since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.Nuzzles at gmail.com. But don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. 
can't believe I drank all of them already. There's gotta be one left. 